Hello everyone and welcome to the beautiful Hunt Library, or at least what you can see of it. I'm here with my trusty mug of coffee to talk about a quick tour of animal-based toxins. And so to get started, just a few learning objectives. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some venoms and toxins that are produced by animals or are part of animals. I want to talk about the bioaccumulation of toxins uh, that are then passed on to humans. And finally, uh, toxins produced by the action of bacteria on decaying animals. So those three things. First of all, uh, when we think about venoms and, and toxins produced by animals, the list is not incredibly long. We can think of things like puffer fish. Um, if you are adventurous enough to travel to Japan and try this out, um, you are certainly taking your life into your hands. If you try to eat this as sashimi, uh, potent neurotoxin that's produced by the animal itself. Um, there are not many uh, poisonous animals that we as humans uh, intentionally consume. Uh, on the other hand, there are a, quite a number of food animals that uh, by their very nature, the proteins that they are composed of are allergenic to some individuals. So they comprise part of that big eight category of allergens. And so, of course, you can see here fish and shellfish, uh, eggs and, uh, and dairy all comprise part of those uh, allergenic uh, proteins from animals, which we will discuss uh, in detail a bit later. Uh, much longer is the list that includes the bioaccumulated toxins passed on to humans. So we talked in an earlier video about bioaccumulation and how important that was as a means of passing toxins on to, uh, on to uh, humans. And so one, uh, we can think about things like mad honey, um, uh, which contains granitoxin. This is not the only toxin that can be passed uh, through honey to humans, uh, but this uh, bee product is one of those that has been written about throughout history um, as of particular uh, concern. It, it results from bees that are, that are pollinating, taking nectar from particular plants. There are others exa other examples of this, but granitoxin is one that is, uh, particularly, uh, is particularly famous. Uh, cattle um, who uh, are consuming snake root and goldenrod, which they tend to do when, uh, when other plants are not available, and those plants are, uh, can cause uh, severe illness and even death. Uh, apparently, this was the cause of death for Abraham Lincoln's mother uh, was was consuming milk that uh, had been contaminated uh, contaminated by this particular toxin. Today, we we worry a lot less about it because uh, milk is uh, mixed uh, with uh, the milk of many uh, other cows, and so therefore there's a dilution effect, and so this is uh, this is less of an issue overall. Um, polar bear liver. Uh, probably something you you haven't uh, you haven't consumed. If you haven't, then uh, don't start. Um, but the idea of bioconcentration of uh, large amounts of this vitamin up the food chain, uh, the polar bear being the apex predator in the Arctic environment, and uh, being able to um, uh, being able to concentrate this. Uh, in a way that for them is non-toxic, but if the polar bear liver itself is consumed, is quite toxic to humans. Some of the accounts of polar explorers who, who actually um, did this uh, talk about the entire outer layer of skin from head to foot sloughing off, not exactly something you want to have happen in the middle of, uh, of an environment as harsh as, uh, as the Arctic. Um, ciguateratoxin is an example of algal toxins, so fish consuming uh, different types of algae uh, which may, may contain toxins and this toxin from the algae being passed through the fish to the human who consumes it. Um, and so this is one of the uh, issues with consuming uh, fish that are associated with, uh, with reefs. They'll, they may uh, consume the algae and then pass that on. Um, lastly, large fish uh, that uh, tend to be long-lived, uh, tuna, shark, uh, tilefish, these type of, uh, these type of animals uh, can accumulate mercury either from, uh, either from uh, contaminated ocean water that may have been contaminated from an industrial source or 
from mercury, which may be naturally occurring in certain parts of the ocean. Either way, uh, methylmercury, which is highly fat soluble, can get into the fatty tissues of these large fish and uh, can then be passed on to, uh, to humans. So bioaccumulation is a uh, really big part of toxins and animals. Uh, lastly, the toxins that are produced by the action of bacteria. So as food scientists, and from the perspective of food toxicology, uh, what we're dealing with, uh, for the most part, uh, unless you're a really big fan of, uh, say, consuming uh, live raw oysters, which I would not suggest, uh, we're dealing with things that are not alive. So uh, whether it's uh, chicken tenders or a steak or, um, or what have you, uh, or shrimp, these animals have, are, are no longer alive when we are preparing them, uh, processing them, storing them, and then ultimately consuming them. What that means is if there are any breaks in the cold chain in the, in the storage of these animals, that microbes can quickly take advantage of the situation, start consuming the fuel that they find, and start producing toxins. And this is exactly what happens with scromboid poisoning. Uh, microbes already present on the fish. If there is just a small break in the cold chain, the fish are not well frozen or are not held uh, at a cold temperature. Uh, the amino acids can be converted to histamine. This is just one of many uh, what are referred to as bioactive amines, uh, compounds that can be produced from the uh, breakdown of protein by bacteria and uh, can have very powerful effects. So histamine, as we know, um, is the active ingredient in, um, in allergenic reactions. And so you can have an allergy-like reaction, even if you're not allergic to fish, through the consumption of preformed histamine. Uh, botulism. Um, so this is well known, originally known as sausage poisoning. Um, the, uh, the growth of Clostridium botulinum in an anaerobic environment and the resulting production of the most toxic uh, compound known to man, which happens to be a protein. Um, this is through bacterial action. And then a uh, uh, third example, and there are others, but a uh, third example that I'll uh, mention here is the Vibrio bonificus toxin, which you can uh, which you can come into contact with by consumption of raw oysters. So not only do the uh, do the vibrio uh, bacteria uh, cause an infection? They can they can populate um, the digestive tract, but also uh, they produce toxins which can be harmful in and of themselves. So, uh, just three quick examples of how the action of bacteria can uh, can cause harm to humans. Uh, one quick reference, uh, as was requested, I'll just say that a lot of information that we've discussed and more is found in the reference at the top of the Moodle page, um, and that is uh, the reference on naturally occurring toxins. Uh, so you'll see quite a, quite a bit more information if you go there. So before we leave this, because we're starting to talk about toxins. We're going to start next week talking about plant toxins and then move on to fungal toxins. There are so many toxins that we, that we discuss in the context of food toxicology, but have you ever wondered how something so small, by definition, things that we consider to be uh, highly toxic, because we know that anything can be toxic at a certain dose, but things that we consider to be highly toxic, those that only require a small amount of, uh, of material to do any harm to us, have you ever wondered why that is the case? Because we, as humans, um, measure our weight in kilos. We're fairly large, and a very small amount of, of, a, of a highly toxic substance, substance can do us great harm, even though there's very little of, a, of, of it compared to us. So um, just a few of the mechanisms by which we can be harmed, not just by animal toxins, but also by other toxins that we're going to be uh, mentioning throughout the rest of the semester. So you can see here, if something functions as an anti-nutrient, if it prevents us from using or utilizing uh, a vitamin or uh, a macronutrient, then uh, certainly that can uh, that can cause us harm. Narcosis, uh, basically uh, putting us to sleep, um, and depressing the central nervous system to the point where uh, we not only become sleepy but unconscious, comatose, and then uh, and then 
uh, cannot survive this. Uh, we have acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitors, ion modulators. Both of these are related to nerve transmission. If you stop those critical nerve transmissions, then that can have a great uh, toxic effect as well. And you really only need to stop it for particular systems, say those that are related to heart rhythm or those that are related to uh, lung function to have, uh, to have a, uh, a very harmful effect. Um, cell respiration inhibitors and pro-oxidants. Uh, some of the cell respiration inhibitors work against the oxidative mechanisms that we need to live, to survive, to, to metabolize, whereas uh, pro-oxidants actually go the other direction and make this process of oxidation through which we derive energy um, uh, kind of overdo that to the point where we're, we're damaging essential systems um, through these pro-oxidant actions. Um, and, and then the last two uh, that I'm mentioning here, and this is not a comprehensive list, but the last two are really long-term um, chronic type of, uh, of, dis of diseases that may, that may require significant amounts of time uh, to, to see any effect. So one through six, these could be things that uh, produce their effects almost immediately. Um, carcinogens, on the other hand, take years, even decades, maybe even almost an entire lifetime to show their effects. And so this is one of the issues with studying them is that they take so long to develop in humans who relative to most other animals are quite long lived that it's very difficult to, to study them and to study the exact effect of diet on health, which means that we're typically using animal models, in vitro models, other types of models to try to figure out um, how uh, potentially carcinogenic some uh, substance or some diet or some material in our food could be. Uh, teratogens are those substances that cause birth defects. So over, uh, over the uh, nine months of pregnancy uh, and the development of, of the infant, this is when uh, we can see effects and just a minor change in these developmental pathways uh, can, lead to, uh, can lead to major birth defects or even, uh, even death of, of the infant. So um, these are just some of the mechanisms of harm that I want you to, uh, to, to be thinking about as we're talking about, oh, well, these, these toxins that we have in our environment. Um, of course, in terms of organ systems, again, not comprehensive, but just to think about if we shut down uh, the, the heart and the cardiovascular system. Uh, if we have lung toxins, if we have liver toxins, uh, kidney toxins, um, neurotoxins that affect our brain or affect our ability to move or to breathe, all of these can have, um, can have uh, toxic effects to different extents. Um, uh, remember that from an earlier video, we, we discussed the idea that um, the reason something is toxic is because of the dose. So how much um, and then how often, um, so how much do we get at a single exposure? How often does that, does that exposure happen? And then how long does that exposure last? Um, so is this um, seconds, minutes, days, weeks, decades, right? So, so keep those things in mind that as we've discussed them. All right, well, uh, that is all we have for this short video. Next time we'll be talking about uh, plant toxins 